G'day guys, we've had a bit of action now in the trade period, so I thought I'd do a video very quickly for you to summarize everything that's happened. There's been a bit of chaos today. Um, you know, it remains to be seen exactly what impact it's gonna have on deals. Like, does it result in certain deals not happening? Um, there's a lot to unpack here, to be fair, and it really centers around the the deal between Carlton and Hawthorne, which has implications on both the Dan Houston, the Tom Barris deal, and in fact, the Liam Baker deal potentially. So we're gonna start there, but there's plenty to uncover and we've got a couple of new trade requests as well, uh, which would set us up for an interesting week too, where I guarantee things will happen a little bit quicker. Before we get into it, I know I do this a lot, but I can't help but notice that there are 60,000 return viewers on this channel in the last 28 days. So that's people who have watched a video and then come back and, and been regular to some extent. And I'm just saying it would mean a lot to me if you would consider subscribing to this footy channel. We do all kinds of content. We cover the trade period, the draft, and the footy season in general, of course. So I understand people watch YouTube and don't necessarily think about subscribing, but if you would consider it, it would mean a lot to me. All right, let's crack in. And we're going to start with the Carlton Hawthorne stuff because of the ripple effect. So Carlton and Hawthorne have struck a pick swaps trade set to have major implications on the AFL trade period. The Blues have received pick 14, which belonged to Hawthorne, and sent their future first and second round picks to the Hawks. So we know that on the one hand, Carlton's motivation here is to get another pick in the first round, and presumably that was to go after Dan Houston. Now, I'm not entirely convinced that is what this is for, but we will crack into that shortly. Um, as for Hawthorne, the flow and effect for the Tom Barris deal was this pick 14 was originally reportedly lined up for Tom Barris, and it's reported. Hawthorne grew tired of offering the number 14 pick for the Eagles defender Barris without results and instead decided to maximize its access. So it's been reported that Hawthorne had offered a future first and a future second for Tom Barris, with the Eagles giving up Barris and a future third going back to Hawthorne. Now, as it's reported, this offer was sitting with West Coast. Hawthorne got sick of waiting. They decided to do a side deal with Carlton. So that deal is completely off the table. So let's get into the implications. First of all, let's start with Carlton. Now, we know that they were going for Gold Coast pick 13, which seems to be pretty much tied up with Collingwood now. There's absolutely no guarantee about that. However, it did appear, reading the media flow, Collingwood had emerged as the front runner for that pick. So Carlton have explored a lot of opportunities to get into the first round. They've ended up with Hawthorne's pick 14. So kudos to them. The reason I'm not convinced this is at all for Dan Houston is, first of all, that's two. I have remained skeptical this entire time that pick 14 or pick 12 on its own, maybe with some change later, is still not gonna be enough to prize down Houston loose. Um, I've made that pretty clear on this channel. However, we do know that Carlton don't wanna trade both of those picks. They've been adamant about staying in the first round with one of their picks this year. So I'm not completely convinced by that. It has come out. I read that Carlton are interested in trading for West Coast pick three which would undoubtedly involve pick 12 and pick 14 this year. So it had been reported that Carlton had offered pick 12, a future first and a future second for West Coast pick three prior to the deal with Hawthorne. Now, presumably they're still interested in that and would go pick 12 and 14 for pick three. So does that not indicate as strongly as anything else that Carlton is not serious about Dan Houston unless they're trading pick three for Dan Houston? And then to be fair, that's closer to the money, but everything else we've heard suggests that Carlton don't want to trade out of this first round. So my conclusion here is that Carlton are making moves to access the draft as best as possible. They ideally want to pick in the top three and are more or less you know, resigned to the fact they're not getting Dan Houston here. That's my takeaway from this. So that flows on to what happens with Dan Houston now. Now we know that he, it was reported by The Age a few days ago, I think, he would like to play for Collingwood. I don't know to, to what extent that uh, he is wanting to play for Collingwood above all else, or is he, was it just simply saying he would play for either, he'd be happy to. Regardless, it, it seems to be quite clear that Collingwood are going balls to the wall on this one. So as we left it, the Pies are keen on trading Noble and their future first round pick for the Suns pick 13 and 23, although the Suns don't want to include 23 in that deal. So then Collingwood want to trade 13 and Richards to Port Adelaide. One thing that made me laugh is that it was then reported that Collingwood would then presumably trade 13, 23, and Joe Richards to Port Adelaide for Dan Houston. However, they don't want to include 23 now because then they think Port Adelaide would split 13 with Sydney for 19 and 22, which would give Port Adelaide three late teens, early 20s picks for Dan Houston. And I have to agree with Kane Corns. Why the hell do Collingwood care what Port Adelaide do next? We are just going off what is being reported and it's not always true, but like, I don't get that. So to summarize, Collingwood want 13 and 23 from the Gold Coast Suns. They then want to just trade 13 and Joe Richards for Dan Houston, which in my opinion, as I've said, 
is a very lukewarm deal and I would expect that to get rejected. One thing that also made me laugh about Collingwood in this is that while they're negotiating with the Gold Coast Suns, so they're asking for 13 and 23 for Noble and a future first. Gold Coast are balking at that. And then Collingwood says, what about Bailey Humphrey? <laughs> it's like one of their best young talents. It says the Magpies flagged their interest in Humphrey as part of talks to progress the trade, sending Noble to the Suns. However, Gold Coast has blocked any chance of the exciting midfielder forward being part of any deal. What the hell, Collingwood? Like you're already struggling to get them to agree on terms that help you unlock Dan Houston and you still go, eh, what about one of your best young players? <laughs> I'm not throwing shade at Collingwood. It's just, it's just funny. It's just funny. Let's talk about how this affects the Tom Barris deal. And if anyone wants my thoughts from a West Coast perspective on how today's trade impacted West Coast, I'll leave a link in the top right corner of this video to my Eagles fan channel. The video about that should closely follow this video if I'm editing quickly enough. The difference between the two channels is I really give a very Eagles fan perspective on that one without trying to be too nuffy, but of course, can only help myself so much. Uh, but yeah, Tom Barris. So, so as it was kind of originally reported, it was sort of implied that Hawthorne, actually explicitly said Hawthorne, um, you know, more or less did this trade behind West Coast back. They had an offer pending. They removed that and have now traded that pick 14, which was forming a central part for the Tom Barris deal, which is interesting. Um, you know, as an Eagles fan, I did four seasons of emotions on that one. I it was agitated, then I was kind of happy that we weren't trading Barris for, you know, a pittance. Maybe the deal falls through, and, and ultimately I'm happy considering it's not helping us get draft picks. But anyway, I think I've ultimately come around to the idea that um, this is probably more a flow and effect to Richmond. So let's say that now who Hawthorne hold two first rounders and two second rounders in next year's draft, their own and Carlton set. This allows them to now trade a future first and a future second, perhaps with some change moving around as well to get Tom Barris. So effectively the offer is more or less the same on value in theory, except it's not a pick in this year's draft, it's a pick in next year's draft. Now this offer would have not been legal previously because if you trade a future first, you can't trade a future second without trading in a future second. So effectively, this deal with Carlton allows Hawthorne now to offer a future first and a future second to the West Coast Eagles. So on the one hand, it just pushes that pick into the future. Now, the thing is, that pick was always gonna to go to Richmond, presumably, for that's how the way it's reported. It was going to go to Richmond for Liam Baker. So if you follow that flow chart in the same way, it's Richmond's first round pick they're getting for Liam Baker that is now in the future. Now, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world for Richmond. Do they really need to take seven new players on three year contracts, which is now the stipulation for all first round draft pick contracts now. Is it the worst thing if they push an asset into the next year? I don't, I don't think so. What affects the Liam Baker deal most is if now the tensions between West Coast and Hawthorne have reached a point where they're not gonna do a deal at all. I'm skeptical. I think a deal still gets done. Tom Barris gets to Hawthorne somehow. And if that's the case, then in theory, West Coast do have enough to get a deal done for Liam Baker. So the thing is where Richmond hold the cards to some extent, and I use that term very loosely, is they can still say no to whatever West Coast offer for Liam Baker. So does that open the door for Liam Baker to get to Fremantle if Richmond is unwilling to accept what West Coast is offering? Now, elephant in the room, Liam Baker is uncontracted and could walk to the preseason draft. I don't think that's a realistic avenue here. I don't think, you know, I don't think West Coast is going to be the team that screws over another team like that. It's not in West Coast nature. Liam Baker is also loyal to Richmond to some extent. He does not want to see them get screwed over. But if West Coast weren't at fault, right, with Hawthorne doing that side deal and the offer for Liam Baker is inferior to what it once was. That's not West Coast's fault. And that is relevant here because Liam Baker, he wants to get home and maybe he would play for Fremantle, but he just wants to see Richmond compensated fairly. And West Coast's offer of a future first potentially or whatever, like some change coming back, is not an unreasonable deal. So is that enough to get Liam Baker to not commit to West Coast, to move to Fremantle? When you consider McWalter and Graham there at West Coast, I think Liam Baker does want to play for West Coast. I suppose what I'm saying is, Liam Baker would go to Fremantle if West Coast were being unreasonable. In this case, they're not being completely unreasonable. Now, don't get me wrong. It is still distinctly possible that uh, Liam Baker does not share my view and he goes, nah, stuff it, I'll go to Fremantle. That opens the door for them. But I'm not convinced at that moment that the Baker deal is completely ruined. And even if Barris doesn't go to Hawthorne, maybe there are some other ways West Coast can still get this done. We'll see what happens there. But I think on the whole, I still expect those players to end up at the clubs they've requested trades to. We'll summarize a few more deals before we wrap up. <laughs> this is more Clayton Oliver stuff. What a surprise. Um, so lately, like since the last time I really spoke about this, 
Uh, this bit has been more conjecture and it's, it's hard to tell like how much is this for clicks and engagement at this current point in time. Brad Green, Melbourne's president, is adamant Clayton Oliver's not going anywhere. There was a suggestion that he cleaned out his locker. Brad Green came out and said, well, you know, we were between Amy and Casey, so everyone cleaned out their locker. I don't know. I, I kind of regret clicking on that article. However, th there is a report and it says there's a source at Clayton's management and a source at Geelong who said that Clayton Oliver is willing to take a pay cut to go to the Cats. Does that really speed along the deal? Really, it's Melbourne that hold the cards there. And by hold the cards, I mean, I'm not saying that they can get a really good deal for Clayton Oliver at this point. Like the situation is so messy, but they ultimately decide whether they do the trade. So him willing to take a pay cut is probably not that motivating for Melbourne. In fact, it's completely irrelevant unless he gets his wish and Geelong profit. There were some more pick swaps today, which uh, are relevant. Brisbane traded pick 73 in a future second to Carlton in exchange for picks 34 and 66. So that's Carlton getting back into the second round. They traded one of them to Hawthorne and now they hold Brisbane. So probably a little bit of a downgrade if you assume Brisbane finishes higher, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. And Brisbane get a whole stack of points because they also did a deal with pick 20. So that's Richmond getting pick 20 and Brisbane received 32, 42, 43 and 45. So they've made up in that second deal alone, they made up nearly 800 draft points. I think this is the last year where, you know, these sorts of deals are going to happen. So Brisbane cashing in late. They, I don't know exactly where their points sit, but they're in a pretty good spot to land those players. And Richmond get pick 20 as a result of their good strategy last year. Uh, speaking of Richmond, Dan Rioli, uh, the only update here is that it's going to move into next week. Craig Cameron says, we understand Richmond's demands, but hopefully they can understand ours. We think pick six is a very good pick in this year's draft, and that is what we have on offer. So effectively, Gold Coast are holding firm on pick six, which I think is entirely reasonable. There is another update on James Peatling, just simply that Adelaide have an offer in. Adelaide are happy to give up 46 in a future second round pick as long as there is a later swap of picks that would mitigate a deal for them. That's from Tom Morris. So the update there is like, there's an offer sitting with GWS. There's some other tidbits. Harry Sharp from the Brisbane Lions requested a trade to Melbourne. Um, he has played 16 games across four seasons, but there's a logjam of young midfield talent at the Brisbane Lions. Uh, there's Tunstill, this prior, in addition to Dev Robertson, who is also exploring his options. You can understand why some of these guys are looking to get out. Dev Robertson was linked to West Coast last year. There's no homesickness as such. I think he's just thinking about his career prospects. So West Coast is an easy candidate to throw up, but he could go anywhere. And honestly, like I think he should possibly consider someone like a Richmond. So yeah, Harry Sharp, Devin Robertson, likely to leave the Brisbane Lions this year. They'll be replaced by Levi Ashcroft and Sam Marshall. GWS also put in an offer of pick 50 for Jake Stringer. Um, so this is a tricky one because he's 30, but come off a pretty good season. I think if you kick 40 goals as a medium forward uh, at 30 years of age, you've, you've still got some short-term impact. And Essendon, he's not out of contract. They're just unwilling to extend him. Would they accept pick 53 for Jake Stringer? Matthew Rosa was quoted as saying, I won't speculate given no official trade request has been made, but like any other player, he's a contracted player. It would need to be adequate compensation. So I know that is the party line. I know every club says that, but to me, like reading that, I don't think 53 is going to get it done. The Giants do hold 37. Would that be attractive? Uh, it, it probably is in the ballpark of what's fair. It really comes down to Essendon and what kind of stance they want to take with Jake String here, but that is a bit of an update. Also on Essendon, Finn McGinn is likely to stay at Hawthorne. However, there is some interest in Jacob Constanti potentially as a delisted free agent. Small forward from Sydney, who hasn't got another contract at the Swans. Probably not going to happen in a trade, but Essendon is showing some interest there. He's a player I've talked about in recent trade updates. But that's all I got for you today, guys. There was a bit to talk about there, and the flow and effects uh, get a little bit murkier. But like I said, I think all in all, the players that we expect to move will still get to the desired clubs. I think Barra still ends up at Hawthorne. Liam Baker should still end up at West Coast. I think Dan Houston's going to end up at Collingwood, given Carlton's move imply that they're not actually going that hard, in my opinion. But keen to hear from you. Let me know in the comments what you think, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.